Hello there, my name is Mikko Hyppönen and we are shooting this video in January 2011, which is exactly 25 years after January 1986. So what's important about January 1986? Well, in January 1986 we found BRAIN. BRAIN, the first PC virus in history. The PC virus is 25 years old. And what has happened during those 25 years? Early viruses were only spreading on floppy disks. Viruses would only jump from one PC to another if you would physically move a floppy disk between the computers. And perhaps the most interesting thing about these early viruses is the motive of the virus writers at the time, in the 1980s and early 1990s, because they didn't really have a very good motive. The early viruses like Brain and Stoned and Cascade and Form, they were only written because the guys wanted to write them. They weren't benefiting in any way from writing these viruses. They were basically jokes or they were basically challenges. These guys wanted to write viruses to show that they can write viruses. And we also started seeing destructive behavior in viruses. For example, the infamous Michelangelo virus from 1992 would be destructive. On certain dates it would overwrite everything on your hard drive. Why would somebody do that? Well, we don't know. Perhaps they were destructive in nature and they wanted to show what they can do. But more and more of these viruses in the early days were playing games with the user or were showing some kind of jokes. So for example, the V-Sign virus when it would infect your computer, it would show this V animation on your screen. So basically, you would know that you were infected by the Vsign virus because you saw this animation. Or look at this one. This is the Walker virus. It would show this guy walking across your screen whenever you would be infected. And here's one more example. This is the Elvira virus, which would show this nice animation on your screen. Some of these viruses would show graphics, like the Denzuk virus would show this logo, or ask the user for interaction, like the Joshi virus. Once a year, on the birthday of the virus writer who was known as Joshi, your PC wouldn't boot up. Instead, it would show this message and the machine wouldn't continue to boot up until you would type in a happy birthday greeting to the virus writer himself. So obviously viruses at the time, you would know that you're infected because you would either lose your files or you would see something shown on your screen, or maybe the virus would play music in the background. And creating viruses was also changing, because we started to see virus generation toolkits, like VCL, Virus Creation Laboratory, which was basically a graphical user interface to generate new viruses. So you just select the options you want out of a menu, and it will create a virus for you. In the early 1990s, we started to see more viruses, which would use stealth or rootkit technologies, like the monkey virus and the one-half virus, which would both hide themselves very effectively, so you wouldn't find them even if you were looking for them, unless the antivirus program you were using at the time would know about the technologies. And of course, we were already shipping antivirus products at the time. F-Secure has been fighting this from these early days already. But then the game changed, because in 1995, we found the first viruses which wouldn't infect floppy disks or wouldn't infect your program files, but would infect documents. Concept was the first example, and it would infect your Word files, your Word document files. So every time you share a Word file to someone else, you would also share a virus. And these macroviruses became the most common type of viruses for the upcoming years. And this change was very sudden. We started seeing these in late 1995, and in two or three months, they were already the most common virus type. We also started seeing specific viruses targeting Windows. So most of the attacks before these days were old DOS-based viruses targeting PCs running MS-DOS or PC-DOS. But for example, Boza virus was actually a native Windows binary. It would infect other Windows binaries and actually show, again, a message to the end user, but at this time it would show the message within Windows. And there were many other Windows viruses coming out, like Martwork, which would show an animation showing different signs on your Windows desktop, and Happy 99, which was the first email virus in history, which would greeting you Happy New Year 1999, and it would email itself further. But then we started seeing combinations of viruses. 
For example, Melissa, which was a Word document virus, a macro virus, and an email virus at the same time. So it would take and infect your Word document files and then email those files further to people listed in your address book. And those people saw the email coming from you. So, of course, they would open it and their Word would get infected and they would send their files further to other users. Big headaches at the time. Thankfully, we got rid of macroviruses because Microsoft changed how a VBA macro language works within Office applications, killing off the whole problem. Then we started seeing native email viruses more and more, uh, like Love Letter, which still stays in their history books as one of the biggest outbreaks ever, and uh, real network worms like Code Red, which were replicating directly between computers. So it wouldn't require user interaction. The user wouldn't need to click on attachments. The user wouldn't need to do anything at all, and they would get infected. Worms at the time, like Slapper, Slammer, Blaster, Sasser, and these would go around the world, some of them in minutes, infecting computers, which at the time, we're talking about 2003 and 2004, had no firewalls by default. So they would just get infected and replicate further. And these worms at the time were generating massive amounts of network traffic, in some cases even affecting real-world systems just because of the network traffic they generated. 2003, we saw Fizzer, which was, in our books, the first virus which was actively trying to make money by infecting computers. And this is, of course, a big change. The way Fizzer was trying to make money was by taking over infected computers and use them to send spam. And spam still continues to be a problem to us today in 2011. Other viruses of the time include Sobic, MyDoom, which was an email worm, Bagel, another big email worm, NetSky, SDBot, Kabir, which was the world's first mobile phone virus. And in this case, it was targeting phones like the one I have right here. This is a old Nokia Symbian device. Um, I believe Nokia 6610. Kabir would target mobile phone smartphones like these. So we've been fighting mobile phone worms already for seven years. But it has never become as big a problem as we were afraid in the early days because of the job done by different mobile security vendors. More rootkit attacks, like Hackstore and the infamous Sony rootkit, which they were shipping on music CDs, which was a stupid thing to do, but that's what they did. That was 2005. Stormworm, one of the biggest cases in history. You can see the very first outbreak of Storm on this video that we shot in our lab, looking at our monitoring screen when Storm started spreading for the very first time. And we're getting closer to where we are today. Modern Windows rootkits like Mebroot, which is so advanced that even if your machine crashes while you're infected by Mebroot, Mebroot will take a diagnostic dump of the crashed Windows computer and send that dump back to the virus writers so they can make a new version which won't crash. Or attacks like rogue antivirus products and rogue security products, which we know as different partnerka attacks. Viruses like Configure from 2009, one of the big mysteries we've ever seen all the way to where we are today, to attacks like 3D Anti-Terrorist. 3D Anti-Terrorist is targeting Windows smartphones, running Windows Mobile, phones like this, and it would start to make phone calls to expensive numbers, bringing you large charges. And then, of course, Stuxnet, which is probably one of those game changers we've seen in history. So, from Brain to Stuxnet, from 1986, to 2011. That's 25 years in the history of PC viruses. And I hope that in 25 years from now, in 2036, I won't be doing a 50-year roundup of PC viruses. Hopefully we've got rid of these by then. Thank you very much.